Sooner or later, much later, it dawns on you that your life is changing radically too. You are adopting a new role, caregiver. And the biggest hurdle is that most people don't identify as caregivers. Women say, well, it's just what I do as a daughter or as a wife, but it's a professional level role today. And boy, do you need a, a circle of care because this is a job nobody applies for, nobody's been trained for it, you don't expect it. A West Coast woman entrepreneur told me uh, about the shock she got when her mother was immobilized after a fall. The entrepreneur said, you know, I had nine months to prepare for the birth of my child. I had about nine hours to prepare for the dependence of my mother. In one in four American families, somebody is performing the role of family caregiver for another adult who used to be independent. And the average family caregiver today is a 49-year-old woman who holds a paying job, spends at least 20 hours on the role, still has a child or children at home, and this is all at the expense of her teenage children, her mate, her friends, and most of all, uh, at the expense of her own health and well-being and future financial security. More than half of American family caregivers hold full-time jobs, and the caregiver spends an average of five years on this role, with the needs escalating. She often has to give up her job and sacrifice her own uh, future financial security. We all feel like, what am I doing wrong? The answer is nothing. You're doing so much right. I know you know that the presence of a family member who will act as a fearless advocate is a matter of survival. Well, the secret of caregiving success took me years to discover. Quite simply, we cannot do it alone. No one can. We must create a circle of care. And that's why I wrote my book, Passages in Caregiving, to try to show how. Creating a circle of care means growing a network of family, friends, neighbors, colleagues from work, and most important, most valuable, veteran caregivers, because they can show you the ropes. And maybe finding college students who are studying nursing or health, health sciences, and who would be willing to volunteer or might be able to gain credit for helping a family caregiver. <clears throat> I recently learned from Dan Sokolow, who's director of the MacArthur Genius Awards, about a unique two-way communications platform that's available on the patient's smartphone or on the landline. It connects doctors and a long-distance caregiver in a healthcare team to create a network specific to the individual patient. Early Bird Alert, it's called, is free and is provided only through approved healthcare plans. So it's something I think you should check out. As people are living longer, the global sweep of Alzheimer's will come with astronomical costs for families and for public health budgets. This is becoming a problem in every country, in Europe and Asia, where the expected lifespan is beyond 70 or 80. And there, Japan and a lot of European countries are aging faster than we are even here in America. Dr. Sam Gandhi, a neurologist and psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital, is an international expert on Alzheimer's. I met with him this week to learn about a new test he's pioneered that can pre-diagnose the disease years before, maybe even decades before, first symptoms appear. He began our conversation with a sticker shock I'll never forget. Every family member who develops Alzheimer's will cost somebody a million dollars. A million dollars, why? The average lifespan after diagnosis is 10 years. And many Alzheimer's patients are perfectly healthy in almost every other regard. The caregiver can easily spend $100,000 a year to take care of a stricken spouse or parent or in-law. This epidemic is so disturbing that we mostly deny it and fail to address it. But now there's also some good news. The onset of memory loss can be delayed and once a person has the diagnosis, the progression can be slowed. It's very recently been proven that exercise has a delaying effect. <clears throat> the best prevention is 30 minutes of cardiac movement or strength training, training at least three times a week. You've heard that before on, for many other uh, illnesses, but also for delaying Alzheimer's. 
The other delaying tactic is mental engagement, but it has to be mental engagement with some activity that the person really enjoys so that they will do it regularly. And here is hopeful news for the caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. You can still interact with a loved one who has mild to moderate disease by introducing creative activities that are non-verbal. There's good evidence now that encouraging Alzheimer's patients to make art, to make music, to sing, or to listen to music can bring them back to greater consciousness. These nonverbal activities can call up memories they still do hold, usually from childhood, and get them thinking about it and expressing it, uh, and light up the part of the brain that is least and last affected by the disease, the parietal lobe. And that reduces the amount of drugs uh, sufferers will need. So this is the wave of the future, non-pharmacological treatment, using the chemicals that are naturally present in our brains. Good. But let's be frank, the Alzheimer's epidemic isn't going to be solved by running treadmills or doing crossword puzzles. It's only going to be solved in the lab. And so we must all advocate for a race to the cure of Alzheimer's. And I mean advocate as loudly as AIDS activists did until public and private efforts turned that terrible scourge of death into a manageable chronic illness. Right? <laughs> Oftentimes, men don't change until they hit the most serious of deadlines, a life-threatening health crisis. So I'm going to close with a story about my husband to illustrate the point. In his mid-60s, my husband had radical surgery to remove malignant lymph nodes in his neck. <clears throat> he was upbeat all through treatment, but afterward he slumped into depression. It's very common. His former life as a magazine editor and publisher was unrecoverable in many aspects. He found it hard to adjust to this new normal. Two years later, we were in another oncologist's office who was telling us about a new cancer. He said, this is a low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The median survival rate at your age is 10 years. But since you have no symptoms, and early treatment does not improve your lifespan, I'm going to leave you alone. Well, we said, what? No prescription? And he said, no, my advice is go out and live your life, the two of you, and do something wonderful you wouldn't have dared before, and do it together. Well, we sat stunned. I mean, this wasn't the usual 10-minute consult with a dehumanized, uh, de uh, uh, for, with, a, with a physician talking to a dehumanized patient. This doctor was talking to my husband man to man as a person of action and intelligence who was just depressed by losing his former way of life. And he was including me, the caregiver, as a full partner in our goal of healthy living with cancer. Well, we walked out of that office on a cloud, but clouds don't hold you up very long, so we had to act. Strike out for some new way of living and life that would stimulate and mobilize us. Well, my husband spent a lot of time trying to get at what it was about his work that he most loved. Uh, he was a magazine editor. He'd been stripped of title, of setting, and I think anybody who has been through the first assaults of aging and disease needs to go through that exercise. Find out what is really, really important about you and what you and only you with your unique concatenation of talents and experience can bring to the rest of your life and to others. We made it an exercise we often did together on long walks. The answer for my husband took a whole year in coming. And one day, finally, he said, I love identifying and shaping young talent. Well, that suggested a teaching role, but, a, but an active teaching role. And it was his circle of care, writers and artists and editors whose careers he had nurtured, who took it from there. They came up with the idea for getting a university interested in establishing a magazine center where Clay could work with students, hands-on, to learn how to make magazines. The University of California, Berkeley, was excited about it. All we had to do was tear up the life we'd spent decades building in the dense world of New York publishing and move 3,000 miles to start over in the Bay Area, living like graduate students. 
Well, we moved into a faculty apartment. We went back to the brick and board bookcases and fighting over one bathroom. And then we found a running track that overlooked San Francisco Bay. And suddenly, our horizons were unlimited again. After running, we'd walk down to a sidewalk cafe for lattes and hot oatmeal. And as East Coasters to sit outside in the winter reading the New York Times, it was a little like heaven. Well, we were young again. And we were in love all over again. And that passage brought passion back into our lives, professionally and personally. We were full of aliveness and hope. The mind-body cure worked for us. That lymphoma never came back. <laughs> we had a bonus life together of another 10 years. Well, I hope I've encouraged you to use a major passage as a transformative moment to educate adults from their earliest to their latest years how to make healthy passages across the lifespan and how to create their circle of care. And I hope each of you will start today, right here in the middle of your professional network, to reach out and start building your own circle of care. Thank you. <laughs>